All right, uh, I'm David Bernholt, back to talk a little bit about the design of scientific software. So this is a diagram that we showed before. Um, I want to talk about kind of what we're seeing here because it's an important part of the phenomena that are driving uh, the importance of good software design in the computing that we do. So we start out with a model typically of some physical phenomena that we want to understand uh, and we implement that model and we do some science with it and that helps us gain uh, more of an understanding. And typically because it's early in the game and because we, uh, especially in the past, haven't had as much um, compute capability available, that model tends to start in a very stripped down fashion. And as we um, increase our understanding, we start to understand more about uh, what features of the model are, or features of the physics are important to bring into the model and things like that. And we get higher resolution, we get more uh, physics phenomena in place and things like that. And uh, to address those things, we need to have you know more diverse and more sophisticated solvers. And that ends up taking more compute resources to solve, uh, but we get more scientific understanding out, out of it. And that drives further improvements in the model. And we go around the circle. And we've been doing this uh, in computational science and engineering for quite a while now and um, have really been able to drive the physical modeling of some, uh, modeling of some physical systems to a, a really quite sophisticated state. Uh, and that's great for us. Uh, but it also introduces challenges. We've seen over time um, a good deal of increase in the software complexity as the models get more complex and more sophisticated and things like that. So if you see in this graph on the right, um, in, there was a period of time uh, back when most computing was uh, based on the distributed memory model where the software complexity increased um, really quite a lot at the time when the platform complexity really wasn't increasing. This was about a 20, 25, 30 year period where distributed memory parallel computing uh, was really you know, the thing. And um, so the platform stayed kind of pretty stable for a long time. Uh, and then more recently, we've transitioned into this uh, sort of purple part of the curve where we're seeing both more heterogeneous models. We're starting to put uh, or a couple multi-physics and, and things like that into our models to increase uh, the, the scientific understanding. And at the same time, to advance the hardware capabilities, we've had to start moving towards heterogeneous computing with uh, GPU accelerators and other types, types of things brought into the mix. So suddenly, now we're in a mode where we're increasing the software complexity, and, and that's still going um, pretty strongly. But we're also very rapidly increasing the platform complexity that we have to deal with. Uh, and then in addition to all of this, we, you know, basically uh, many, sometimes all the components of a large software package may be the subject of research in one way or another while we're working on things. Uh, and no matter what's going on, the software continuously evolves. You're adding science, you're addressing functional issues, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, and if you're, you know, doing discovery class science, especially, you know, every big um, simulation campaign that you're doing is probably a, a different, unique case for the science. So it, it taxes your application uh, in new ways, and you have to deal with all the complexities that brings to the table. And so, you know, these kinds of experiences uh, over a long time have led us to some basic design principles for uh, HPC scientific software. And so this, uh, this slide shows on the left some of the considerations that we need to deal with, uh, and on the right, some of the design implications that we uh, infer from those. So, you know, one of the things that we've seen, uh, especially in the last 10, 15 years uh, is the rise of multidisciplinary teams. It's really much rarer these days that a single hero programmer um, can 
know everything about a piece of software. The software is just getting larger and larger and it's more complex and the methodologies within uh, are, are more complex and require deeper expertise to do well. So it really becomes infeasible for one person to know everything uh, about a piece of software. And so one of the ways to deal with that in the software design is called separation of concerns. So you want to encapsulate aspects of the software so that um, you know, the experts can deal with what's inside and they expose to the rest of the code uh, clearly defined APIs, interfaces uh, that, that will provide the functionality that the rest of the code needs. And therefore you're shielding the people on the other side, uh, outside this, this little um, ball of concern, you're shielding them from knowing the, all the inside details. They just have to know that it's gonna conform to this interface and um, you know, that's how it works. So you can imagine a solver, the solver might be a really complex thing on the inside, but all you need to know as a user of the solver is you know call it with this API. Here are the data structures. Here are the um, control parameters, things like that. Right? Um, you should really be thinking about your software in terms of two different types of components, and this is true for almost any software of almost any size. Um, there's uh, infrastructure kinds of uh, components, and there's the science model. And so, you know, the science model is the miracle methods that implement the physics and things like that. The infrastructure, things like meshing and discretization, IO, data management, uh, runtime uh, systems, things like that. Uh, and, and what that leads to in, from the software design perspective is working with uh, different elements of the um, software with different um, design considerations and different life cycles and different types of complexity. So typically your the science side of the code is going to be more mathematically complex and um, will be changing quickly because that's where the new science gets implemented by and large. And then the infrastructure is likely to be longer lasting. It will support a great deal of evolution in the science, especially if you've done a good job of designing it. So it's long lasting. Uh, it may be logically very complex to deal with, but um, oftentimes, you know, it doesn't have the same level of mathematical complexity as the um, physical models do. So, um, so you end up with different parts of the code and you should really, you know, be willing to think about them separately. Uh, and a third thing is that uh, codes grow over time. Uh, it's, um, you know, even if you start saying, I just want to do this one thing with this code, uh, you know, then suddenly it works. And now you get an idea that you want to add some new feature and new capability. It's almost irresistible. Um, and, and you also want the code to be able to be reused by others in, in other contexts, other scientific contexts, or if you're a library writer or things like that, you know, uh, other applications. And so you need to think from a design perspective about how to ensure that the code is extensible. You need to build in capabilities that will help ease the addition of new capabilities and the customization of existing capabilities so that you can easily extend and, and modify the code over time. So this leads to a picture that uh, might look like this. So uh, in the kind of teal area up top, we've got the, the model, the physical model, um, which is the primary subject of your research activities. Um, and, and you think of this as the client of the code. This is the stuff that's changing most uh, frequently and, uh, you know, can plug it in and plug it out and do different models and things like that. And that's supported by this code in purple that's more stable and provides the infrastructure, deals with the data structures and the data movement and the runtime parameters and, you know, meshing and things like that. Um, and so this is, this is that separation that I talked about on the previous slide. To both types, uh, both areas of, of the code, you want to apply some key principles, right? One is that the, um, all, the, all the code should be uh, separated into 
small, you know, localized functional units of computation or of work, right? A, a kind of encapsulation. Um, you should think about these things in the context of a framework. And if, you know, there are, um, uh, especially on the infrastructure side, there are frameworks out there that you can pick up and use in some cases, um, but you should think about um, whether whether you're doing that or not, you should think about kind of a, a framework, a structure that things can plug into and plug out of. Um, part of that is defining interfaces so that everything, as I said, is, is well encapsulated with well-defined interfaces that differentiate between the public and the private aspects of the code. So there's some data structures that only need to be exposed inside a chunk of code and there's others that need to be exposed outside to be able to interact right um, and and that those are very important distinctions that help protect everybody so that you can change this piece of the code and you can change things you know the data the private data structures inside uh, without impacting anything else in the code uh, and that facilitates your ability to evolve and customize and, and change the code. And, and this applies to all aspects, the infrastructure as well as the, um, the model code. And then another really important thing that we've learned over time is to focus on the general design first before applying a programming model to it. And, and that's a really important consideration because experience shows that if you start with a particular programming model in mind and you force your design to fit to it, um, it's unlikely to live that long. Programming models change. And, and we're going through a, a period of, um, you know, very rapid change right now and, and this is causing you know some applications that are too tied to a certain way of doing things to be left behind because they can't adapt so here's a model for design um, that you can think about basically you see on the left side uh, the infrastructure aspects of the code and on the right side the science capabilities or the model however you want to describe that so on the infrastructure side um, you really want to do a good job of requirements. Think about what your models are going to need to support them. Uh, and you want to think about this in a fairly general way um, so that you can you know, provide uh, enough support for the future, um, uh, the extensibility consideration again. And you design uh, a set of APIs, a set of interfaces that can provide that functionality and then underneath those APIs, you implement it. And of course, you need to do a lot of testing. Testing of infrastructure is extremely important. Testing of everything is extremely important, but the infrastructure is something uh, that the, the model side needs to just be able to rely on absolutely. Okay, and so then, you know, you get your infrastructure ready and, and that goes into maintenance mode in a sense. Um, and at the same time, thinking about the capabilities, you've got a model that you want to implement. Well, that also has, um, you can think about that in terms of exposing interfaces and how those interfaces connect with the infrastructure. Then you can, um, you can do your development to, to prototype these capabilities and you validate the capabilities in your model to see if they're providing the science results that you want. And you, um, integrate with the infrastructure to uh, get everything working together. And you may find that you actually need to augment the infrastructure. You've, you've missed out some capability or you want to evolve the model in some way that the infrastructure doesn't currently support. So the touch point here is that you need, you uh, sort of um, motivate some uh, improvements or enhancements to the infrastructure, which um, changes the API and you go back through this, this cycle. And so this is a, a, a general way of thinking about the structure and design of a, a large complex code that can be really useful to help sort of break it down into uh, manageable chunks. 
So let's think about how this looks in a fairly simple example. This is the hands-on example. And basically the, the physical situation is we have um, a house with a wall, there's a pipe running, water pipe running through the wall. And then on the outside, uh, it's gonna get to a really low temperature due to a storm. So inside it's a nice cozy 70 degrees, outside it's gonna get to minus 40. And what we wanna know is um, when is that water pipe going to freeze? Right, and and so this is the code that we've um, that we'll be working with in the hands-on activities, uh, and so let's think about it. Just for, it's a very simple kind of problem, but let's think about what the um, how this breaks down, right? So we have a specification. We're going to solve the heat equation, and we've been given some initial and boundary conditions, right? And something that I didn't say before, but um, you know, as part of our our um, uh, uh, research activities, we want to investigate different integration algorithms and how they work in this setting. So um, part of our criteria is that we want to be able to change out the integration method, right? So what's the infrastructure here? Well, we're going to need to dis discretize the problem and maintain the state. We're going to need to verify the results. We're going to need to, to output the results, apply the initial conditions, things like that, right? And then the model is actually the initial conditions, the boundary conditions, and the integration algorithm that we need to do. So it's a fairly simple breakdown, and you can define some fairly simple APIs. These are the APIs that are actually in the code. So this is the infrastructure. We're going to process the arguments so that you know you can put something on the command line and, and it will do something uh, meaningful in the application. There's an initialization step. There's a couple of utilities that copy uh, and write data structures. And then there's uh, something to set the initial conditions. And then on the numerical side and the model side, uh, in the center here, we've got three uh, different integrators that we're implementing. We also have, um, we know how to compute the exact solution in this case, so we can do that and provide a point of comparison. And we have an L2 norm to, to judge uh, differences, the accuracy of the solution, essentially. So this is a very simple breakdown and this is, um, you know, something that we can work with in that the hands-on code. Um, this is, you know, just a, kind of a toy example. So let's think about making it a little more complex. <clears throat> so now, if we think about, um, you know, a typical PDE problem that we want to solve on just a distributed memory parallel computer, um, we start thinking about some of the ab abstractions that we want to come into play. Right, and a fairly typical way of approaching the solution of this is um, to break down the domain, the physical domain into chunks and portion them out to the different parallel processors uh, and then apply the operators for the PDE in each chunk, okay? So on the top, we have the spatial decomposition aspect. And on the bottom, we have the functional decomposition aspect, the operators. Uh, and these give sort of two different perspectives, uh, two different kinds of abstractions, which apply to the problem. Um, so in the case of the domain decomposition, we start getting into things like, um, how do you um, exchange boundary conditions and, um, and things like that, and how do you, you know, scale out the problem? Uh, how do you assign the, the um, chunks of data to the different processors, things like that? So there's uh, optimizations that can be had there, the parallelization and scaling and things like that. And on the um, functional side, on the operators, there's, uh, you know, we create a collection of components that represent these operators, and those are operating and have, um, you know, memory accesses and compute operations that can be optimized. And so we can then break down and have different uh, people with different expertise look at these things and help us out, right? We might, might wanna get some uh, applied math folks and domain experts to help us implement the operators correctly um, and for the scaling and parallelization and, and these other optimization activities, we can talk to our friends who do performance engineering and software engineering to help us with those things. Um, sometimes those people are all the same, especially in small teams. People have to wear um, multiple hats, but it's um, 
it, it's useful even in that case to have to be able to sort of change the ways you're thinking so that you can focus uh, more deeply on different aspects of the problem without getting too complicated. You can take this even further. This is uh, an example from the flash astrophysics code, um, which is really basically designed from the start uh, with a component concept. Those components carry with them some, uh, we'll call it metadata about say the state variables that they need to access and things like that. And they provide this metadata in uh, a way that uh, a Python tool can parse it and configure. And so you can assemble these components in different collections of components in different ways to get different simulation capabilities. Um, and so this is a fairly sophisticated, long-lived application that has been designed for this kind of extensibility and modifiability right from the start. So what have we learned so far? So if we're thinking about this distributed memory model kind of computing, um, you know, we've seen it's useful to differentiate between the slowly changing infrastructure and the more quickly changing science um, elements of your code. You really want to do a good job of understanding the infrastructure requirements and then implement separations of concern as you're designing the whole system. You also want to think about portability, extensibility, reproducibility, and maintainability as you're doing the design work. And you want to not focus on a particular programming model when you're doing the initial design. Now we're thinking um, more about the current day and age, we get this more um, increase in platform heterogeneity. So the question is, do these design principles change? Uh, and the answer by and large is not really. Um, they get, the details get more involved, but the fundamentals don't really change. So the key points in this model that we had where the changes are most likely to occur are these touch points that we have, right? We're gonna be changing aspects of the API uh, in the infrastructure and in the capabilities and how they uh, interact with each other and uh, some aspects of the integration will likely change. Uh, and just to uh, I'll visual, help you visualize that in a second, but some of the principles that we've learned from the Exascale Computing Project and from other experience uh, to help get performance portability across a wide range of uh, different compute architectures are first of all, to design for hierarchical parallelism, design towards several thousands of threads running concurrently, um, assume a hierarchical memory space. So there are diff is not a homogeneous memory space, but there are different elements that have different performance characteristics in a sense. Uh, and that implies that you need to be able to sort of track and control the, the memory usage, you need to be able to you know, allocate it in the right place and make sure it's being used and, and um, in some cases moved around, moved between the host memory and the GPU device memory and back and forth, things like that. And finally, you want to avoid uh, using non-portable or vendor specific options insofar as possible. And so now let's go back to our uh, PDE solver problem and think about how this new you know, more heterogeneous environment starts to change things. If we look up here in the uh, domain decomposition area, we may have additional complexity because uh, maybe some of the compute is being done, uh, for example, on a CPU and some is being done on a GPU, right? So we have to worry about things like um, where the memory is and um, how those loads should be balanced. And um, we have to make sure that the memory, you know, the data gets moved from one place to another if that's required and things like that, right? So we introduce additional abstractions that we have to deal with of, you know, how to distribute the load within the node. That this is basically what we're talking about here uh, and how to, how to manage the runtime. Um, and then on the functional side, the, the, um, uh, the operators and solvers and things like that, uh, one of the challenges that you face here is different types of compute units often um, prefer different types of uh, memory organizations to access the data. So something that you'll see um, in a variety of contexts is wanting to be able to transform uh, the, the way data structures are stored depending on which type of 
process you're using. That's something that um, uh, there's a variety of ways to do it with that it fundamentally involve code transformations, whether they're hidden from you or exposed to you. That's, that's more of a detail. Um, but these are all, you know, new abstractions that get introduced, but the fundamentals, you know, the basic breakdown, uh, the basic decomposition, the basic idea of, um, you know, spatial and functional decompositions and things like that, that's still all there. These are refinements down in the details. And um, so we're talking about these abstraction layers. And <clears throat> so basically what they're trying to do um, one way or another is they need to, um, you need to have a way of mapping the algorithms uh, and the, to the devices. You need to be able to um, uh, understand the data movements. Uh, and then the system can map the computations to the devices and move the data as appropriate and things like that. And different uh, abstraction layers provide different ways to do that. For example, in OpenMP and OpenACC, you use pragmas, uh, structured comments essentially, to indicate um, some of these characteristics like um, moving the memory and that this computation should take place uh, on an accelerator uh, and things like that. Um, and um, there are other approaches, for example, uh, in C++, Cocos and Raja and things like that provide abstractions that can, um, that can, for example, automatically map uh, arrays to different or data structures to different formats for you behind the scenes and things like that and specify uh, that certain computations should be offloaded, what have you, right? And ultimately what you find is that the, um, the performance you get out of these uh, approaches and these abstraction layers depends on how well the mapping is done. So it really has to be uh, a combination of you understanding, you know, what's going on in your application uh, and being able to use the tools, the abstraction tools effectively to implement appropriate uh, uh, um, layering of the computations. And to dig into that a little more, um, another way of looking at it is to, to basically say, um, we have this code that represents our algorithm and we wanna make the ideally the same code work on different devices and, and work well. So really we want to be able, ideally we wanna be able to tell the compiler that this expression for our algorithm um, can be specialized in different ways depending on you know, the different types of processors and the different memory hierarchies and things like that, that the system may have. Uh, so in C++, people do this these days with what's called template metaprogramming. And this is things you may have heard of like Cocos and Raja. Uh, a lot of capabilities are being incorporated into the C++ standard itself. Uh, and it's becoming, you know, more and more powerful from a parallel and concurrent computing perspective. Um, but um, these are also ideas that you can, if you understand them, you can implement in other um, language environments, even if you don't have, you know, the help that something like C++ gives you, right? So, um, and then, you know, once you have these ideas of these abstractions, then basically um, within a node, you're assigning work to, to processors uh, in a particular way, typically a parallel four, um, and saying run this concurrently uh, and let a lot of threads go to work. Um, it may be, you know, there may be explicit data movement involved or you may have a unified memory environment. These are different things uh, that the abstraction layers can take care of or you may have to deal with explicitly. Um, there are also um, asynchronous runtime environments. Uh, asynchronous multitasking is a, a sort of common term, Legion and HPX and things like that, that you may have heard of. Um, these aren't that widely used yet, but they're becoming increasingly known and they have value because they can uh, increase the, the amount of asynchrony available in concurrent computations, which is valuable from for a parallel scaling perspective. Uh, and so really what you need to do when you're thinking about the abstractions in your code is uh, look at what's needed uh, to express the computations and design for the common features across many of those computations. This is important whether you're doing this yourself or whether you're using third party uh, abstraction tools, understanding the code structure uh, and the, the requirements, how it works is really critical to get 
performance portability. And that really translates into a knowledgeable design effort, a thoughtful design effort. So um, the final takeaways for this part of the presentation, the key to both performance portability and the longevity of your software is good design. You should build extensibility into the design. You should not design to a specific programming model and uh, composability and flexibility and extensibility help with performance portability as well. And here at the bottom of the slide are uh, some resources that might help you uh, explore these considerations a little more. And with that, we are done.